Uh, I'm sorry. Good evening. Thank you. And welcome to Loyola University's 14th Grand Seminar. And I'm told that this is the largest Grand Seminar we have ever had. So, Adam, you're a hit. I'm Terry Sawyer, and I have the honor of serving as Loyola's 25th president of Loyola University, Maryland. And I want to welcome all of you here tonight. We are delighted to have you on campus for the chance to highlight and celebrate our natural and applied science programs here at Loyola. We are fortunate to have exceptional and thriving natural and applied sciences programs at our university. Our students certainly did us extremely proud just a few minutes ago next door at the poster session just before this event. Fantastic research that's being conducted by our students and their faculty. In recent years here at Loyola, we have seen a significant increase in the number of students entering who want to study STEM fields. Almost a third of this year's incoming class has identified STEM areas as their intended majors. We know that that's a credit to the outstanding academic programs we offer in the areas, um, in these areas that we have dedicated faculty who are fostering the intellectual growth of our students. That is what we're going to see tonight, and as we saw a few minutes ago, lead to outstanding outcomes for professionals that study STEM at this university and go on to do truly amazing things. We know it's also thanks to the extraordinary success of our alumni like Chris Miller, Vice President of Respiratory and Immunology at AstraZeneca, whom we recognized with an alumni award earlier this evening. Congratulations, Chris. And one fu fun fact about Chris and Adam, who you'll be hearing from, is that they are both Harbor Fellows here at Loyola. So for the Harbor Fellows in the room, fellows in the room, you have um, a, a bright future ahead of you with many opportunities, and we look forward to welcoming you. I actually met a student who declared to me that she will be receiving this award uh, in a few years. So you know who you are. Good for you. In fact, the research that Adam did during the summer of 2000 was on the human genome, work that he finished at NIH. Through the Grand Seminar, we welcome distinguished scientists to share their research and insight on topical subjects with the entire Loyola community. Their talks engage students and faculty from all disciplines, as well as other members of our Loyola and Baltimore community. There is so much to be excited about in the STEM fields and specifically here at Loyola, and we're so happy that you have joined us for this important celebration. So tonight, we are honored to welcome Dr. Adam Philippi to Loyola. To introduce Dr. Philippi, I want to welcome Dr. Shell Moore Thomas, our pro provost and vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Moore Thomas. Good evening, good evening. Thank you so much, President Sawyer. And thanks to each of you for joining us this evening. Now, every year we look forward to bringing to campus a world-renowned speaker who can both challenge and inspire us for this annual event. This year, we are honored and delighted to have Dr. Adam Philippi with us. Dr. Adam Philippi is a senior investigator at the National Human Genome Research Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. In that role, he develops computational methods for analyzing massive genomic data sets. A 2002 graduate of Loyola University, Maryland, Dr. Philip, he received his degree in computer science and went on to earn a PhD from the University of Maryland. Dr. Philippi is a multidisciplinary scientist who has devoted his career to reading and understanding genomes. His work has contributed to a wide range of applications, including forensic investigations, outbreak tracing, plant and animal breeding, biodiversity preservation, and the diagnosis of rare genetic diseases. He is best known for his work on completing the human genome from telomere to telomere. Dr. Philippi was named by Time Magazine as one of the most 
influential people of 2022, an outstanding achievement. But we certainly hope that he's also equally proud that he was named Natural and Applied Science Alumni, given that award last year. Tonight, we are honored to have him with us here at Loyola University, Maryland. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. How do I advance my slides? Here he comes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Moore Thomas, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I will say the NAS award does mean a lot more to me than the Time Magazine award, because it's all from whom it's given. And the people that presented that to me last year mean a lot more to me than Time Magazine. So I'm very honored to receive that. Do we have slides? Well, as they're working to get that up and running, here we go. If I go through this, will I find mine? All right, they're gonna get my slides up. Well, I'm gonna tell you a brief story while they do that. Um, having the honor to give this grand seminar reminds me of some words that my mother said to me the first time I was ever giving a scientific seminar. And she said, are you sure you have things to say that those people want to hear? <laughs> and uh, I hope I have things to say tonight that you wanna hear. And mom, if you're watching this, I love you. I'm as surprised as you are <laughs> that I have things to say that people might want to hear. How are we coming, AV team? Gonna be a minute. I'm out of stories. No, I have one more. I have one more. Uh, for the Time Magazine influential people list. That was for the innovator category, I think. And none other than Zendaya was in my class of innovators in 2022, which made me the coolest dad at my daughter's high school when they found out that I was on the same stage as Zendaya. <laughs> well, I know what the first few slides are, so I'm going to start into the talk knowing what the first few slides are. Um, the first thing I wanted to do today, you know, being November and being Thanksgiving coming up is give thanks to the people at Loyola that affected me the most. And I was so blessed when I joined this university, uh, 1998, class of 2002. And the first person that I met was on a visit day, like you're gonna be holding very soon. It was probably a fall visit day. And I went to visit the computer science department and there was a prof there at the time named Art Delcher, who was the department chair later on. And he was running the visit day and welcomed me to campus and gave the lecture. And we were just so smitten by Art and his love of teaching and his passion for the research that he was doing that we were absolutely sold. And my mom was also smitten by his bow tie. He would wear a bow tie to class every day. And she thought that was pretty cool. And uh, Art just sold us on Loyola came back and long story short, Art Delcher made my whole career because it was the Harbor program that he encouraged me to join. I worked with him that summer. The summer after that, he got me a job at the Institute for Genomic Research in Rockville, Maryland. Thank you, Byron. I'm trying to bring up the picture of Art now. There we go. That's Art. Yeah. On the left, and that's 2002, uh, probably around graduation time. And that summer internship that Art got me then turned into my first job at the Institute for Genomic Research in Rockville, Maryland. And I don't know how Art did it, but while he was department chair of Loyola, he was also working part-time for Solera Genomics, which was doing the Human Genome Project on the private side in Rockville, Maryland. And somewhere amidst all of that 
uh, double duty, he found time to mentor me and really launch my career. And then I had the privilege of actually working with Art while I was doing my PhD work. He was at Maryland as a research scientist for a number of years. Um, the second person in the CS department that I would really like to give a shout out to is Dr. Roberta Sabin, who had her hip replaced 11 days ago. So I'm wishing her a good recovery. She reached out to me yesterday apologizing that she couldn't come because of this hip replacement and promised to watch online. Dr. Sabin, hello, much love to you. I hope you recover quickly. Probably one of the best people I've ever known in my life. When you talk about somebody who's just good in their soul, she taught me that you can be brilliant and kind at the same time and was the first professor that I had for computer science when I came here. And I never had computer science in high school. I didn't have those opportunities. I kind of went to my first class thinking, uh, maybe feeling a little intimidated. Her teaching style was just so perfect for me. And she inspired me so much into this field of computer science that it was wonderful. Then my internship at the Institute for Genomic Research uh, introduced me to the two gentlemen you see in the top right, Stephen Salzberg and Mihai Pop. Mihai is now at University of Maryland, Stephen's at Johns Hopkins. And I've worked with those guys, you know, 20 years on uh, in the field of genomics. And so it was really Art and Robbie Sabin introducing me to computer science, giving me those foundational skills, and then translating it with Mihai and Stephen that I'm here talking to you today about the human genome which is really weird because I didn't take a biology class at all at Loyola. <laughs> so when I went into Art's office and said, I wanna help you do your research, he sat me down and said, it's really easy. You have A, C, G, and T, and it's literally in a text file. And you're gonna read that in with some computer programs and write some algorithms to compare different genomes to each other. And it was like two kind of computer scientists wading into this field, and that was really all we knew. So I'm gonna start all of you off assuming you knew about as much as I did at the time. And this is really all you need to know for this talk is that the genomes of any individual are entirely comprised of this four letter alphabet, A, C, G, and T. And we call them base pairs because they always come together in pairs, A with T and C with G. And this is really elegant from a DNA perspective because this is how DNA copies itself. It just splits those two strands into two individual strands. And then because you know A always pairs with T, you look at that single strand anywhere you see an A, you pop a T on, pop a C on, pop a G on. And so that double-stranded nature of DNA allows it to replicate itself. And it has to do that a lot. A single human genome is about 3 billion of those ACGs and Ts replicating continuously. And they're arranged in a human genome into 23 pairs of chromosomes visualized here. You've probably all seen a figure like this with the sex chromosomes, X and Y. Um, but what often gets unsaid when we talk about the human genome is that every one of your cells actually has two human genomes within it. And it's not 3 billion base pairs of DNA. It's about 6 billion base pairs of DNA. And why do they come in pairs? You all kind of know this, whether you realize it or not, it's because you have parents. Your mom and dad both have two genomes within all of their cells. You inherit one copy from your mom, one copy from your dad. All of your cells have one of mom's copies, one of dad's copies. And they slightly shuffle when they get transmitted from parent to child. So the genome you have from your dad is a little bit of a mix of his two genomes. And the genome you have from your mom is a little bit of a mix from her two genomes. And in each one of those cells, I like to think of them being trained as a computer scientist, as little biochemical computers, and the DNA is the code. And what happens with that DNA gets opened up and transcribed into what's called messenger RNA. And these little messages go, get taken up by what are called ribosomes and translated into proteins. And the proteins are what make up your whole body. Everything in you is coming out of this process. Those proteins and those RNAs can then interact back with the genome and create these feedback loops called gene regulation processes. And that's just the conductor of this whole orchestra of your genome. And these little computers are taking cues from the environment and other cells around them, executing their little genomic code and creating outputs. And so I kind of approach this problem as the genome from the idea that this is a code to be understood and analyzed. And I'm not the first one to think like this. When we talked about the genome, people often called it the code of life. Um, and what does it look like? This is an exhibit in London where somebody actually printed out the whole 3 billion base pairs of a human genome and put it on a shelf. It makes up a whole bookshelf worth of pages. Uh, that's 6 billion bases per cell. And when we're looking at it computationally, because it's a four character alphabet, each of those bases is represented by just two bits. So 0, 0 for A, for instance, 0, 1 for C. And so if you tally up that 6 billion, it's about 1.5 gigabytes 
of data in each one of your cells. And if you actually open up a human genome file on my computer, I checked, it was like 1.6 gigabyte zip file of just DNA text sitting on my computer. And what people often find funny when I describe what I'm doing is that we literally just analyze text files. It's just a TXT file basically on your computer full of nothing but ACGs and Ts. And then I laugh that I looked at the size of the MS PowerPoint executable on my laptop, and it was bigger than the human genome in terms of gigabytes. So we as humans are really inefficient coders that we need the same amount of information to write PowerPoint as the universe needs to make a human being. It's an interesting comparison. Another funny point that I like to make, not so funny given the recent pandemic, is that the analogy goes actually quite deep of cells, DNA, and computers. And then when you talk about computer viruses, they are very, very similar to human viruses. On the screen here is the entire genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's about 30,000 uh, individual characters long. You can fit it on there. And to think that that bit of information, when inserted into your cells, causes your cells to go haywire and just generate viruses and viruses and viruses is exactly like you get a malicious bit of code in your computer and its job is to replicate itself onto other computers. And so it's a fun analogy when you really dig into it like that. It's basically a selfish bit of code executed by your biology that just replicates more and more viruses. And so I really love being in this field because genomics really is a big data science. And I like to go through this little exercise just kind of drive home, as you said, the massive amounts of data that we deal with. Think of any one of your bodies, around 3 trillion of your cells has a nucleus, which means it has DNA. That's only 10% of your cells. All of your red blood cells generally don't have a nucleus. Only 10% of your cells do, but there's still 3 trillion of them. There's 6 billion bases per cell. Each of those base pairs is really tiny, about three angstroms. That's like a millionth the size of a human hair, but you have a lot of them. So if you add them all up inside of a single human genome, it's 3.4 billion miles of DNA if you stretched it all out end to end. If you then go and look at all of the humans on the planet, that's 4.6 million light years of DNA on all of the humans on planet Earth right now, which is just bamboozling. And I have pictures here, there it is. So, in a single human genome, you have enough DNA to stretch from here to Pluto. And in all of the DNA in humans on Earth, it's enough DNA to stretch from here to the Andromeda galaxy. So we could spend a lifetime trying to read all of the DNA on the planet, we'd never finish. There's just so much of it. And if you look around this room, it's almost like being in the matrix, right? I must think about DNA too much because everywhere you look, there's DNA on all of these surfaces because there's bacteria and viruses and environmental DNA being shed from your skin cells on everything. And so we live in this DNA world and all of that DNA is carrying information. It's a great information science. So when the Human Genome Project started in 1990, they had a less ambitious project of just doing one genome from basically one cell. And that equals about a meter of DNA. And that seems feasible. We could read a meter of DNA. It took about 10 years to do. It was launched in 1990. It was completed in 2000 at the cost of about $5 billion in today's money in a big international consortia. Um, and it was announced at the White House uh, in the year 2000. And they basically just put a solicitation in the newspaper saying, hey, we need some DNA. We'll give you some money if you come give us your DNA. You'll be the reference genome. And to this day, about 70% of the human reference genome is from some random guy in Buffalo that responded to that ad who remains anonymous. So how did they do it, right? We're talking about these astronomical scales of data. How do you actually go about sequencing a genome? The problem is we don't have the technology yet to just take a chromosome and read all of the bases from end to end. And when this project started, we could only read about a few hundred bases at a time. And so the plan was we're just going to break the genome up into a ton of tiny little pieces and we're gonna start with maybe like 10 copies of the genome, break them all up into tiny little pieces, sequence all of those, and then we're gonna put it all back together again, like a giant puzzle. And if we talk about you know, 500 base reads and Celera Genomics did a 5X coverage of the human genome, it's 27 million pieces of ACGs and Ts that we were trying to put back together again 
like a puzzle. So it was a really challenging computational problem. You obviously can't do this by hand. And this is a cartoon that appeared in one of the newspapers at the time. You know, and this guy's saying, I think I found a corner piece to start with. Good luck. So I want to give you a window into kind of my last 20 years of research and how we actually go about solving this problem. And I promise that this is at a very basic level, but it touches on some of the algorithmic ideas that I learned while I was here at Loyola. So imagine your genome now uh, as just a book, right? And instead of the ACGs and Ts, we just have English words and it's Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. We have five copies of it. It's on these linear spools. We can't read it all in one piece. So we throw it in a shredder and we break it up into little five word pieces. The problem is when you look at those pieces, there's pieces that have the same words on them, but they came from different regions of the text. We call these repeats. Imagine you're doing your jigsaw puzzle. It's the blue sky piece that could have been from 10 different places on the puzzle. This makes the problem hard. We have these short fragments. Some of them are the same. Uh, some of them have errors in it because this process of reading DNA isn't perfect. How do we go about reconstructing it? Computer scientists love to organize data. We love to talk about data structures, way to organize it in a way that we can compute on it. And one of the first things we like to do often is build a graph from the data. And that's what we do here with genome assembly. And the way that we build these assembly graphs is really quite simple as a construction. And if I show you this slide, it wouldn't even make sense why this works, but I'll show you on the next slide why it does. You start with those five word pieces and you actually break them up yet again into smaller pieces, now four word pieces, but you know these four words originated from the same fragment as these four words, and I just have an extra fifth hanging off the end. So they overlap. It's like finding the puzzle pieces that match up to one another. And we represent them as a four word piece with an edge to the four word piece that we knew overlapped the piece before it. And then you just apply that process to all of the pieces in the puzzle saying, look for all of those pieces that overlap by all but one of their words and just draw all of the edges, okay? So when you do that for Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, that opening section, it was the best of times. It, you start seeing it come together. And as you continue that process, you get this really cool structure where all of those pieces that have an edge between them were observed overlapping one another and you see some particular pieces uh, that have more than one edge coming from them, and those are the repeats. And if you stare at this long enough, you can see there is a path through that graph that visits each of those edges exactly once and reads out, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. A lot of those little edges only have one way in and one way out. So you can just collapse all of those down and you're left with this, and now, all of the single ins and outs are connected. And the only thing that's left are those pieces that have more than one edge coming in or out of them. And those are exactly the pieces that are the repeats in the initial phrase. They have two edges coming out of it because when you look at it was the, you don't know if you should follow that up with the worst of times or it was the age of. And so you keep that represented as this ambiguity in the graph. I know that these two come after, I'm just not sure which one should come next. I'm going to just keep it in the graph as this ambiguity. Doing that graph construction is the easy part. Trying to find the right path through that graph turns out to be the hard part. In computer science speak, it's an NP-hard problem to find, say, a Hamiltonian tor through that graph that does it in an optimal way, reconstructing the genome. And I'm showing you an actual genome graph here. This isn't for the human genome. This is for a five megabase E. coli genome. So this is like the simplest genome you could imagine for free living life. And it's already a complete mess. So I'm a little confused. If this is how we assemble genomes, and I just kind of showed you it's an impossible problem, what did they do in the year 2000? And this is the secret of the whole announcement back then. They left out the hard bits. So they announced the genome was done in 2000, but only about 90% of the genome was done. And it was all the unique bits of the puzzle. Turns out to be not a terrible thing. The unique bits contain the genes. And so a lot of the research that's happened in the 20 years since have been focused on finding disease variants within those genes. And that's gone on just fine. But all of these hard bits are what I was interested in as a perfectionist. I really want to go in and figure out how to solve that last 10%. And they did admit to this. Um, when you look at the paper 
uh, that was published in 2004. There's a couple of keywords in here that hint to what's going on. They talk about finishing the euchromatic sequence of the human genome. And if you're you know, a general press uh, writer, you don't know what euchromatin means, and you just kind of overlook it. And then you report to the news, finish the sequence of the human genome. But euchromatin is doing a lot of work in that sentence, because that's saying we finished 90% of the genome. And the heterochromatin is this repetitive 10% of the genome that was left undone. So there was around 341 gaps when this was announced complete uh, in 2004. And just like I said, when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, the repeats are the hardest part. And so they reconstructed the unique bits here, but then left all of these Waldos in the bin, pushed off to the side to be analyzed later, and highlighted on the right-hand side, that's all of the human chromosomes, and the bits in red are the bits that were left unfinished. The point I want to make is that those repeats matter to the genome in some pretty significant ways. Uh, if you look at where the red is in this picture, it tends to be in the center of all of the chromosomes. That's because it's around the centromeres. If you remember your basic high school biology, the centromeres are where the chromosomes get separated. This is like the most critical process for cell division. It's mediated by the repeats that exist in that region of the genome that we didn't have until now. Another extremely critical region of the genome is the genes that express the RNAs that are the RNA component of the ribosomes. The ribosomes I mentioned earlier are these factories that are cranking out all of the proteins in your body. It's kind of a big deal in the cellular process, but because it's so important, it has hundreds of copies of these RNA genes throughout the genome. Hundreds of copies sounds like a repetitive bit of sequence to me. Those regions were left out as well. So if there's any diseases associated with those genes of the RNA component of the ribosome, we kind of would have just been blind to that to date in our genetic study. So it was important to get these regions finished because it's opening our eyes to the entire genome. And now we can find potential uh, mutations within those regions of the genomes that are associated with diseases of these very important processes. So if I were to ask you, this is the problem. We've got a hundred million piece puzzle. What's the solution? The answer is a lot easier than you think. And it's not better algorithms, I'm sorry. <laughs> the algorithms were really good enough. The answer is make the pieces bigger. And this is literally all we did in this project is we waited for 20 years for the technology to come around that we could sequence much bigger pieces of DNA. We reapplied it to the human genome. And then we had this beautiful 24 piece door, the Explorer puzzle that the old algorithms that were invented really you know, 20 years ago were up to the task to solve. And so I wanna walk you through a little bit about how this new sequencing technology works because it's really mind bending. Um, the one that I'm really uh, most optimistic about is what's called nanopore sequencing. And the reason that we were so excited about this when it was released about 10 years ago is that there was really no limitation on the read length. We were able to get single pieces of DNA a million characters long read in a single piece. So these are our DORA pieces that we can start with instead of the 100 base pieces. Um, but this is really just a testament, this technology of the interdisciplinary nature of genomics as a field and DNA sequencing in particular, that they have found a way to thread a single strand of DNA through a protein nanopore that really existed in nature and they repurposed it for this task. This is called a transporter protein that embeds in the E. coli membrane. And it's what bacteria use to shuttle different molecules in and out of the cell through the membrane. They've re-engineered that to shuttle a piece of DNA through it, and they can measure, I'll talk about in a second how they do that, the bases that go through it. And one of the first things that we sequenced with this technology was E. coli. So it's like E. coli sequencing itself, which is really, really wild. And so the dimensions of this are also crazy. So these, that's a single strand of DNA I'm showing you, which I mentioned the space between those individual bases is about three angstroms. So this whole pore complex is about 100 square angstroms. If you scale that up to like a real world scale that you can think about, make that nanopore the size of my fist, sequencing a million bases of DNA is like threading three kilometers of rope through your fist at 400 bases per second. That'll give you a little bit of rope burn and reading off all of the bases as it goes through. So it's just amazing that this technology works at all. And I'm gonna use it as another chance to plug computer science because the only reason we can do this is because of machine learning. Here's why. So this is the same figure just as a cartoon now. DNA is, is negatively charged. So if you apply 
uh, potential to this. It can drive the DNA down through this pore. They have a little motor protein at the top that basically, motor is the wrong word, it really serves as a brake and it facilitates the stepwise movement of that strand down through the pore. And you're going to measure the flux of those ions coming through the pore with some very sensitive electronics on the bottom side and measure the flux of that ionic current over time. And because each of those bases has a different shape, it basically acts as a resistor and prevents the flow of those ions through the pore in different ways. And based on how many ions are getting through per unit time, you can make a prediction of what bases were in the pore. And that's all machine learning. The measurements that this is all on like a custom ASIC chip that's doing these measurements. And the measurements are very simple as a dot plot shows here. It's time on the x-axis and the current coming through that pore measured in picoamps. So really, really tiny fluctuations in current. And you can see that some of those little dots look flat. And so this is a period of time where the DNA was basically static, modulo a little jiggling. Um, and you can then say, okay, well, this must have been one base of DNA because I see this flat pattern of current. And so you go into that signal and you basically segment each of those little flat areas into a segment and say, this was one piece of DNA kind of frozen in time and this is our measurement. You can feed a bunch of known DNA through that pore and use it to learn, okay, this word of DNA matches this current, this word of DNA matches this current and so forth. That gets fed into and trained with a recurrent neural network. And then that recurrent neural network can spit out predictions of for each of these events in time. This word of DNA, GCTAC, for instance, was in the pore at this particular unit of time. And then the DNA is going through that pore stepwise. So each of those words gets a new readoff. Machine learning algorithm spits it out. And they can currently do this at like 98% accuracy per single strand of DNA. And so it's a really beautiful marriage of like electrical engineering, protein engineering, chemistry, computer science, math. It's really, when I say interdisciplinary, this is the example. And this is a company now based out of Oxford in the United Kingdom, unicorn company worth a billion dollars because they figured out how to make this work. People posited this as a potential sequencing method in the 70s or 80s, but it took a company with tons of money to actually do the engineering work to make it work. So with that in hand, we said, let's use this technology to finish the human genome. We have the big puzzle pieces. I teamed up with my tremendous collaborator, Karen Migos at the University of Santa Cruz, and we built this ground up consortium of like-minded people that all wanted to see the genome finished, all with these kind of interdisciplinary specialties. And we call it the telomere to telomere consortium because all of your chromosomes have telomeres on the ends, and we wanted to get the whole chromosome read from end to end. And just like our strategy of making big puzzle pieces, we had a very simple strategy for the engineering side of this. Let's just collect a lot of these very large puzzle pieces. And a scientist at NHGRI, Shalise Brooks, ran this nanopore instrument for basically six months nonstop around the clock to generate the data that we needed for this project. That's one person and one instrument. The Human Genome Project needed rooms of DNA sequencers, as shown here on the left side, and international $5 billion, as I said, worth with that technology improvement from Nanopore and other technologies, we can do it with one person now. And so back to the computer science, we had this assembly graph that had the tangles caused by the repeats, but we needed to simplify that with these long reads. A postdoc in my lab at the time, Sergey Nurk, who now works for Oxford Nanopore, developed the algorithms that zoom into one of those tangles in the graph, where again, we need to find the right path through there. And he would align, oh, it's missing from my slide he would align one of those long reads to that graph and it would suggest a path. For instance, aligning to the DNA on node one first, then node two and node three. Each of those little squiggles is a, basically a piece of DNA and the long nanopore reads would inform which path you should walk through the graph. And then you can just stretch it all out into a single linear path and get the chromosome in one piece. And amazingly this worked. The nanopore reads were long enough our initial assembly graphs were good enough and clean enough that when we aligned all of that long nanopore data to the graph, it straightened everything out for us and resolved all of those repeats. And we got the genome done from telomere to telomere. This was the cover of Science Magazine in 2002 when we announced its completion. And it's a stylized view of all of the chromosomes. And again, the red is the bits that we filled in with this project and it totals about 8% of the genome. The first 92% 
of the genome took 10 years and the last 8% took 20 years. So really just driving home the point that the last 8% always takes the longest for any project. And it was really solved by this combination of long read sequencing and assembly techniques. And what really astonishes me is the technology advance that we've seen over the past 20 years. We've driven a $5 billion project down to a $5,000 basically personalized genome. That's a million fold reduction in costs over the last 20 years because of this incredible advance in technology. So um, I want to end with a little justification of why this matters. So far, it's been kind of an academic exercise. You know, we're seeking knowledge, we're finishing the human genome, but what does it mean for us and for doing good in the world going forward? Um, I got involved, you know, honestly with this project just because I wanted to know what's in that unknown region of the genome. I want to solve this problem. And now my lab's making the shift. All right, we've got it done. What are we going to do next? What can we apply this to? And here's where I'm leaning on a lot of my collaborators at NHGRI that have been doing this for years. We're bringing now more accurate products to them, more complete products that will enable this research at a greater degree of accuracy. The first thing to note is that genomics is a marathon. The Genome Project was released in 2000. And to this day, you open up a genetics journal and there's new variants and new diseases being discovered on a monthly basis. And there's been an explosion in the number of variants associated with disease since the release of the initial Human Genome Project. We're now up to well over 4,000 disease genes, meaning if you have a mutation in this gene, it will be causative of a rare disease. And we know which rare diseases go with which rare variants now, which means if you have a newborn and it looks sick, you used to have to go through maybe like a 10 year diagnostic odyssey to figure out what exactly is making your baby sick. In a lot of cases, you can now just look at the genome and know right away, it's this disease, let's start this treatment, which saves a huge amount of money in the healthcare system. Um, and up to over 60,000, what we call complex disease variants. This is really trying to understand the code. Complex diseases like diabetes and heart disease don't have a single mutation in the genome you can point to, but it's a confluence of a whole bunch of different factors. Here's where I think machine learning, again, will be very useful to understand these complex uh, multi-allelic associations. So to just make it really concrete for you, there's this fantastic project at the NIH um, called the Undiagnosed Disease Program that was launched by Bill Gall, a colleague of mine years ago. And they see cases like this on a daily basis. They've now evaluated over 1,000 patients from around the world. This is just one example of a young Nigerian girl with rickets which is a bone deficiency basically from lack of vitamin D, very weak, fragile bones. This was a blood sample, I believe from Nigeria, shipped to the NIH, sequenced by the Undiagnosed Disease Program, and they identified a mutation in this one specific gene that was known to be related to acidosis. All right, so they knew she had rickets, but not what was causing the rickets. You can't just give vitamin D pills in this case. Um, by finding that mutation in that gene, they now know, okay, acidosis is the likely cause of this start on this alkali and potassium treatment, she should walk again after this, whereas before you can see she's basically restricted to a wheelchair and casts on her legs at all times. Um, they do this on a daily basis. I'm jealous of this team because they get to have these patients in the hospital, they get to change lives. It must be so gratifying. I'm a few levels abstracted from that, but I like to you know uh, ride their coattails from time to time. They're up to now over 300 diagnoses. They've discovered 25 novel genes to science, um, novel diseases to science, but their success rate is currently 25%. So it, they basically are the last resort. They only get cases that have failed diagnostics in the best hospitals in the world. And these are kids that have been sick for many, many years, and they come to the NIH as a last resort, and they're batting 25%. The hope is with complete genomes and better computational techniques, we can push that up as high as it'll go. Another really cool application that I wanted to highlight for you is the idea of liquid biopsies. So think about cancer. Is this cancerous or not? Is it malignant or not? This could be a very invasive procedure if you need to get an internal biopsy done for a suspected tumor. Liquid biopsy is the idea of looking for fragments of DNA circulating in your blood that have originated from those tumorous, those cancerous cells. Those cancerous cells are invading parts of your body. They're getting attacked by your immune system. They're lysing, they're releasing DNA into your bloodstream. You can find those DNA molecules, sequence them, and look for characteristics of cancer. Do they have mutations in them? Do they have unique epigenetic patterns? Are they enriched for certain parts of the genome? And you can learn what signatures in that blood 
is a signature of certain types of cancer. So this is early stages for it, but there's a ton of companies being built up around this space to try to be you know, first to market with an actual uh, validated and fit for purpose test that can do this kind of liquid biopsy straight from blood and be an early detection method for cancers. And this really just boils down to knowing the genome. If we know what a normal healthy genome looks like, we also then can predict what an abnormal or cancerous genome looks like. And a cancer is basically a disease of the genome, kind of like a virus. The genomic code has gone wild, it's duplicated, it's broken, it's replicated, it's mutated, and you can see those mutations in the DNA when you sequence it. Perhaps my favorite example of the past few years is the promise of mRNA therapeutics. So if you had either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine for COVID, you had genetic information inserted into you that acted like a software patch for your immune system. This is the actual sequence that you had inserted for you if you had the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Again, it fits on a little slide. And this is what blows my mind. This is information inserted into your body that then triggers an immune reaction that then grants you immunity to COVID. So this is just mind blowing. The way that this works, if you don't know, is that this is an mRNA. So think back to the original slide showing all of these molecular machines operating. The genome is spitting off mRNAs. Those mRNAs are getting coded into proteins. This mRNA codes for the spike protein alone of SARS-CoV-2. And basically by inserting that into your cells, it's instructing your cells, go make a bunch of spike proteins. They make this spike protein and nothing else. Your body recognizes that as foreign and says, okay, I should be on the lookout for this in the future. And it grants you immunity to COVID infections in the future. Amazing, won the Nobel Prize this year. But it's not just infectious disease diagnostics that this holds huge promise for. Think of it from this coding angle. It's a coding fix in the genome. There's other potential diseases that could be treated with these therapeutics that could be really transformational. Um, as one example, think of something like hemophilia, a lack of clotting. You're missing this one particular protein that's a clotting agent. It's defective in your genome. You could insert an mRNA, not into your genome, but instruct just like the spike protein to make some of these clotting proteins and potentially rescue a disease like hemophilia by applying this mRNA software patch. So again, a huge area of development, a lot of companies being funded to work on this. And then lastly, one that might just kind of blow your minds because it blew my mind when I heard it. What does genomics have to do with climate change? I really applaud this group um, called the Harnessing Plants Initiative at the Salk Institute for thinking outside of the box. Because when I saw this presented to me a couple of years ago, it just seemed so, so cool. So carbon capture, when you think about excess carbon in the atmosphere and you think about things like carbon capture, you might picture like a big air filter sucking air in and filtering out the carbon and blowing clean air out the other end. But what's one of the biggest carbon sinks in all of nature? It's plants. All of their biomaterial is basically carbon that's fixed from the atmosphere. And that's where all of the mass in a plant comes from. Very little of it is coming from the groundwater and the minerals. Look at a picture of the United States. And I don't know, what is it? 30, 40% of all of our land area is maize, corn. The Harnessing Plants Initiative has this idea of what if you patch the current corn genomes to grow their roots a little deeper and to fix a little bit more carbon into the soil. We already have land covered with maize. If we just grow a slightly different variety of maize that's fixing carbon, it's going to bury that carbon a little bit deeper into the soil. It's going to fix it a little more permanently. And maybe this could be a very effective carbon sink. And you can only envision these types of projects because we know the maize genome, we know the genes that are making these carbon fixating proteins, and we can start twisting those knobs and seeing, all right, let's go breed some different corn that might have slightly different properties. So really, really cool, wild idea. So I'm gonna start wrapping up. Um, the title was 30 Years Quest. That's because the genome project started in 1990, but the idea of DNA sequencing was really uh, invented in the late 70s by Fred Sanger and others. And so it's really been 40 years of technology progress of DNA sequencing and assembly. And if you look back at that, I mentioned a million fold reduction in costs. Million fold keeps coming up when we look back 40 years. When Fred Sanger invented sequencing, they were sequencing bacteriophage genomes, which were only 5,000 bases long. And the first computer I learned to program on was a VIC-20. I looked it up, it has five kilobytes of RAM. My phone has like six gigabytes of RAM. That's a million fold improvement in RAM alone. We're going from five kilobase genomes to sequencing six gigabase human genomes. And we're going from like Sanger gel based sequencing 
to threading DNA through nanopores. So this is the inspirational part of the talk for all of you undergrads. A lot can happen in 40 years. Like this has been the trace of my career. I'm now 43 and I've lived through this and it's been extremely fun. It's your turn to grow up and make these advances within the next 20 years of your career. So imagine as you're going forward in your career, if you're in biotech, if you're interested in this kind of thing, what will be enabled by cheap, portable, basically free real-time sequencing? You go into a doctor's office and get a strep test, or you get a COVID test, or you get a flu test. Why do those? Just swab, sequence, tell me exactly what virus is in there. I've even heard Oxford Nanopore pitch toilet-based sequencers, which sounds really weird until you realize that wastewater surveillance has been hugely successful for tracking the SARS-CoV-2 um, outbreak. And that basically by sequencing the wastewater at municipal waste facilities, we can tell where the hotspots are and which strains of the virus are sequencing around the world. For surveillance, uh, I like to think of like weather vanes and weather systems tracking weather now. We've got sequencing to track infectious disease outbreaks. Imagine what I said earlier, everybody getting sequenced at birth. And if your baby is sick, we can tell you exactly why your baby is sick and what potential therapeutics can treat that baby. When I talk to the undiagnosed disease program, it's really, really sad stories of families stressing and struggling for some cases, 10, 20 years, trying to figure out what's wrong with their child. And it's just that peace of mind of knowing this is what's causing it. That alone has a huge impact on the well being of that family and gives them a mission moving forward. Now we know what's wrong. What are we going to do about it? And one of the things I think we can do about it in the next 20 years is really build a strong functional understanding of the human genomic code with methods like machine learning, learning what that code is doing, understanding what can be tweaked, what can be patched to treat some of these diseases. And even now, if you have a patient into the clinic and they have a variant in their genome, it's a needle in a haystack. You're looking at 6 billion bases, figuring out which one of these is the problem causing this disease. The methods that are most successful now are the machine learning, the machine learning based methods that look at the genome and basically give a risk prediction for each of those individual variants. But this is all a marathon. It will take time. These systems are incredibly, incredibly complex. I like to think as cellular systems as these Rube Goldberg machines, that they have 50 different moving parts, and none of those parts make sense because that's just how they are. But they produce a functional output. We need to figure out what all of those parts are doing, and it will take time. We're building this kind of foundational knowledge about the genome that enables future discovery. Again, this takes time. But we do have to move with caution because the technology, as I showed over this last 40 years, has moved incredibly fast. And for those that are 40 plus and saw the movie Gattaca, we don't want a Gattaca society. And if you're young and you've never seen Gattaca, go watch it. Very thought provoking along these kind of topics. What do we do in a future where everybody knows their genome and everybody knows these variants? How do we deal with that as a society, legally, ethically, and so on? Um, it's something that we need to think a lot about in the coming decades because the methods and the technology are there and it can do these things. So I'll end there just with a huge thank you uh, to my lab and collaborators. Zendaya is on the slide. Uh, a dollar bill, if anybody can guess who Zendaya is with in that picture. It's my wife. <laughs> she became the coolest mom at my daughter's high school. And that selfie circulated like wildfire at Northwest High School in Germantown, Maryland, because Ella's mom had a selfie with Zendaya. Going from left to right, Karen Mega launched the T2T consortium with me. Sergey Nurk, now at Oxford Nanopore, led a lot of the assembly work. And then my team at NIH, Adang Ri and Sergey Korin, uh, we were recognized at the Kennedy Center just last month for service to America uh, recognition. And it is with the help of all of those people that all of this is possible. And a 100 plus strong consortium of folks shown at the bottom celebrating the completion of the project in the summer of last year uh, at the beautiful University of Santa Cruz campus. So I'll end there and I'm happy to take your questions. I think we may have a microphone uh, for those who have some questions, but till they bring the microphone, I will take advantage of this. One of our faculty, John Hendricks, sent me an email asking this question. It's a question for you. Um, 
do you envision a future where AI and CRISPR technologies are combined in a way that new life is created in a way that we could never imagine? And what are the ethical implication of that research? A very uh, on point question, and I touched on it a little bit. And so the technology is definitely there that we can use machine learning to basically inform predictions of if I make this mutation in the genome, what's it going to do to the expression of these genes and the phenotype? And this is already basically happening in plant breeding, as I mentioned, for maize and things, animal breeding as well. I'm gonna look at the genome. I want this phenotype, say more ears of corn, tastier corn. What changes can I make to the genome to do that and try it out? And a technology like CRISPR allows you to edit the genome in that way. So that depends on your definition of what's new life. Humans have been crossbreeding animals and plants from basically the beginning of time. We're just much better at doing it and we can do it more precisely now with these genome-based editing techniques. Um, but there are a lot of ethical implications around this when you get into the human space, for instance. And CRISPR editing uh, in humans in the germline has been a really hot button topic that's had a lot of discussion around it and I think deserves a very serious debate about what we can and can't do. Um, I do think that there's a lot of very clearly ethical and easy wins, and that's what I tried to highlight today, is that somebody that clearly has a mutation in their genome that's calling a very severe dehabilitating disease, and we know how to go in and fix that in some cases, even restore sight to people that have retinal degeneration, and why not? You're improving the quality of life of that individual tremendously. It's not really a germline edit of their genome, so you're not affecting later on generations, and it has tremendous immediate benefit. And so uh, those are the uses that I hope will take root, uh, but we do also have to have our guard up for any potential unethical uses or dangerous uses. Thank you. And if you have any questions, there is a microphone there. Uh, we may have time for a few questions. Don't be shy. It's a technical question. It's not a technical. I, I don't know if I need this one. Uh, on your one graph, you showed where it flatlined at certain places and they yeah. identified A's. But what if like the A repeats is yeah. like, how do they tell that that long line is not just a pause or it's yeah, yeah. happened twice? It's a really insightful question because it is currently the Achilles heel of that technology that if you have a stretch of 10 A's in a row or 20 A's in a row, you can't really tell with precision exactly how many A's were in there. They're currently pretty good at um, homopolymer runs up to about 10. And they have, uh, it's dependent on the size of the pore. So they've released a larger pore and it can basically fit maybe eight or 10 nucleotides kind of resident in the pore at a time. And so that's how they can tell. But if it gets bigger than that, they absolutely lose resolution and can't make a confident guess. They basically have to guess with the machine learning methods. It was resident, you know, that flat line was this long and I was watching the other bases progress at this speed. So this must be about 12 or 13 bases, but uh, that's the, the primary error mode of that technology now are the homopolymer ones. Uh, about uh, CRISPR and genome editing, could there be a potential like risk or rather not risk of like people like using it to get an advantage that they otherwise wouldn't have, like say in athletic events or in say academic events. Is that a possibility that you could see happening within a couple of years? Um, it's a possible, it's within the realm of possibility. Like, I don't think that it's technically not possible. Um, do I worry about somebody actually trying to do that within the next couple of years? No. Um, do I worry within like the next 20 years of somebody trying to like engineer a super soldier kind of? <laughs> um, and it it's yet to be seen like how good these ML models become at saying, make these mutations and get this phenotype. If we make that link, then it really comes down to the ethics because technically you could do it. And technically people are doing it in things like plant breeding. And so I think that's where the ethicists and the nations basically have to come together and decide we're not cool with this. Um, but technically, uh, yeah, it's a legitimate concern. In your, prof <clears throat> in your professional and academic journey, what were some of the crucial steps that you took 
and that set you up for for success in this amazing project? Well, first and foremost are the people that I introduced at the beginning of the talk. Um, meeting Art Delcher and doing research with him, I came to Loyola not knowing that research was an option. I was never exposed to it as a kid. I just knew I was good at programming, and that's why I came here and said I was going to do computer science. Art showed me I can apply my skills to answer questions, and I just found that really, really motivating to just go and explore. And so it was meeting Art, doing research with him, and realizing that I could apply my programming skills to this other discipline to actually make science happen uh, was what motivated me. And then it was just connections from them of Art setting me up with an internship, me doing well at that internship, that institute hiring me the following year, going and doing my PhD. And along the way, it's always just been kind of chasing what I'm curious about. And that's the best motivator for me is I really want to know the answer to that question. And so I'm self-motivated to get up in the morning and work hard because I want to figure this out. Thank you. In your original uh, tests, how did you ensure that all the original samples were free of abnormalities before like testing them to become the standard? Yeah, for like the, the genome reference, for yeah. instance. Um, so in that case, there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, the first thing that we did, so we made sure we weren't wasting our time, was team up with uh, a lab biologist that's an expert in fish-based karyotyping. Um, and she looked at the kary a karyotype is basically a, a microscopic picture of all of your chromosomes. And she looked at a whole bunch of those cells that we're trying to sequence and checked that all of the chromosomes are at the expected copy number, it's diploid, no abnormalities spotted at the resolution of a microscope. And once it passed that karyotypic check, we went forward with the sequencing and we did the sequencing. And what really sold us that it was free of any significant abnormalities is we have a whole bunch of other human genomes that we can line it up to. And when we did that, we saw that, okay, it's consistent with all of these other human genomes. And in fact, it's more consistent than the current reference that we're using in a lot of ways. But it's a good question because it was a very valid concern because it was a very unique cell line that we used for this project. Uh, and so we were uh, very relieved to find that the fish carry type checked out and that when we did the sequencing, it also checked out. Thank you. But good question. Let's finish the last question yep. with Dr. Wetzel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Philippi. I had a question about the global benefit of this project and its division fairly between developed and developing countries. How do you ensure that in terms of guardrails and sort of what kind of questions come from the division between developed and developed countries and, and ben benefits that can be gained universally? Yeah, uh, another very good question. Um, first and foremost, uh, my lab is a huge practitioner of open data and open science. And so from the outset of this project, anything that we generated was openly released freely on the web to anybody that wanted to download it, use it, join the consortium uh, and so forth. And that's really how we built the consortium is we put out all of the data and people came like moths to a flame <laughs> to come help us out with that. And so open data was uh, a large component. Um, the next component is really the what's next. And so something I didn't have time to talk about today is what we call the human pan genome project. And the observation there is that this is just a human genome. It's a snapshot from one individual's genome. Any individual in this room is not a perfect copy of all of the other individuals. So the next step is to now go get a broad swath of genomes that represents the global diversity of human genomes. And that's a tricky political task. We're trying to do it and navigate it the best that we can that gets both broad sampling diversity so that we know we have a good broad swath of human genomes that exist, but at the same time, not trying to do helicopter science on other nations and other ethnicities where we're just gonna dive in and do your genome and do it. And so the way that my lab tends to handle that is become uh, an enabler of the science. And so we develop the methods, we develop the technology, and we go out and train other people on how to use it and how to generate their own reference genomes. And we're in the process of doing that now, visiting around the world, doing a global world tour, sending staff from my lab out to different countries, showing them how to do this so that they can generate reference genomes for their own populations as well. But it's a hugely important task um, because if you come into the clinic and want to get your genome analyzed and it gets compared against a reference genome that's not a good match to you, you're immediately at a disadvantage to somebody that comes in and is compared against the reference genome that is a good match for them. So this is exactly what we're doing next. 
Yeah, I would like to, before we thank our speaker again, uh, I, want, I want to thank all those who attended this year's grand seminar, um, about 600 who registered to, who joined us either in person or online, the largest number of people attending a grand seminar event. So, and I think that speaks loud about our alums and how we care about our alums and how we are proud of our alums. The best outcome for a university is, is could be measured only the best ways, I think, with, with what the alums are doing. We, before this, we celebrated uh, we, the, in the next door, we had the 2023 Distinguished Alumni Award for Natural Applied Sciences to uh, Mr. Chris Miller and an outstanding that was followed by an outstanding talk by uh, Mr. Adam Philippi. So I wanna thank all of you for being here and either in person or uh, on uh, through Zoom, but please join me to thank our speaker one more time. Oh my gosh.